this talk, we're going to discuss some basic techniques for creating algorithms that satisfy differential privacy with applications to statistics. So let's start with the basics. What we've learned so far um, are the privacy aspects of differential privacy. We have a privacy loss budget um, and a bunch of restrictions on what a randomized algorithm can do. So specifically for every possible pair of databases that are neighbors of each other and for any possible output E, the following equation has to hold. So if an algorithm satisfies all of those restrictions, we call it a mechanism for differential privacy or mechanism for short. As we saw earlier, mechanisms can protect the confidentiality of our responses. So the burning question is how do we create such mechanisms? So you notice that the definition is non-constructive. It just says that for all pairs of databases and all outputs, we need to check that a corresponding equation is satisfied. And for all practical purposes, this represents an infinite set of equations that must be checked. Right? But who has that kind of time? Uh, so fortunately, differential privacy has some unique properties out of all disclosure avoidance techniques. So differential privacy is modular, which means that complex mechanisms can be built from simpler ones in a similar way to how intricate Lego castles can be built from a few basic building blocks. So all you need is a bit of artistry and creativity. And almost everything that you need consists of three basic tools consisting of um, the Laplace mechanism, post-processing, and composition. There are a few more advanced techniques that we won't get to, but they're referenced towards the end of those slides. So first, let's take a look at the Laplace mechanism and a related concept called sensitivity. So recall that uh, differential privacy relies on the concept of neighbors. Neighbors are pairs of databases for which the differential privacy equations need to be checked. You can define neighbors in um, different ways, depending what information you're trying to protect. The two most commonly used ones are bounded neighbors, uh, bounded neighbors and unbounded neighbors. So bounded neighbors differ on the value of one person's information, as shown in this picture right here. And uh, we use this definition when we only want to protect the contents of someone's response. Unbounded neighbors are preferable when um, we want to protect not just the contents, but also whether they responded or not. We want to protect their participation. Um, so intuitively, the goal of differential privacy is to hide differences between neighbors. So another interpretation is that differential privacy tries to hide the effect of any one person's action. For example, it can hide the effect of participation, hide the effect of non-participation, hide the effect of lying on a survey response, or hide the effect of being truthful on the response. Uh, the concept of sensitivity measures the effect that one person can have. So to make this concrete, let's consider a simple problem. We want to know the average age of voters and the average age of non-voters in our data set. So let's, f, let, let's let f be this function that takes a data set and returns a vector with two components. The first one is the average age of voters and the second is the average age of non-voters. So we wanna create a privacy preserving version of f that gives approximate but accurate average ages in such a way that privacy is protected even in the face of sophisticated attacks that leverage external data sets. So the goal is to inject just enough noise into each of these, uh, each of these two answers uh, so that the effect of any one person is hidden. So in other words, for any pair of data, any pair of neighbors, D1 and D2, the noise should mask the difference between D1 and D2. So it's important to note um, that I said inject noise, not necessarily, um, so inject noise, not necessarily uh, to add noise. Okay, so differential privacy is often used with additive noise, but we're not limited to additive noise. Okay, so in the simple case, let's say that we do want to add noise, and how would we go about it? A common noise distribution we can use is the Laplace distribution. So Ian mentioned the geometric mechanism, which is a two-sided discrete distribution. We can do that if all of our statistics are integers, but in a more general case, um, we could use the Laplace distribution instead. So given a function, uh, and so sensitivity basically tells us how much Laplace noise to use. It, it tells us the scale that we need to use with the Laplace distribution. So given a function f, its L1, sensitiv oops, uh, it's L1 sensitivity is uh, going to be denoted by delta f. Okay? And it's the largest possible impact of one person on f. So mathematically, we look at all pairs of databases, d1 and d2, 
that are neighbors of each other. The difference between f of d1 and f of d2 is the effect of one person. The L1 norm of this difference measures its size. So we compute this difference for all pairs of neighbors and select the largest one, and that's the Laplace, that's the L1 sensitivity. So we'll later see that um, the sensitivity divided by epsilon is the scale of the noise that we would need to add to the value of f of d. And, and so if we want to create mechanisms with additive noise, it's best to do this for functions that have low sensitivity. Okay, so let's try some examples of computing sensitivity. Suppose we have a data set where the maximum allowable age is 115. So that is, if someone marks their age as 120, it gets automatically changed to 115 by the database. So suppose we're interested in the sum of ages of the people in the database. What is the sensitivity of this function f? Okay, so we know that we can create neighbors by adding or removing a record to some database. We know that adding or removing one person to any database can change the sum of ages by at most plus or minus 115. Um, taking the absolute value, you get 115, which is the sensitivity. Uh, now, if you didn't have this cap on age um, over here, or if you didn't know what value to set the cap at, or if you didn't want to add noise with the scale of 115 over epsilon, there are other more complex techniques that are available. Uh, the main point for those techniques is that do not look directly into your data to determine a good value for your cap. For example, don't look at the maximum age in the data set and say that's the cap, because if you do that, you'd be leaking the age of the oldest person. And okay, let's look at another example. So now we're interested in the number of people who are 18 years or older. So adding or removing a record from any database will just change this count by plus or minus one. So the sensitivity for this function is just one. Okay, now here is a case where f returns a two-dimensional vector corresponding to the number of people living in group quarters and the number of Asians in the database. So again, to compute sensitivity, we can look at the largest possible change in f we can achieve by adding or removing one person from any database. In this case, the largest change is achieved by adding or removing one Asian individual in group quarters. So this will cause the number of people in group quarters to change by plus or minus one and the number of Asians to change by plus or minus one for a total change of two, and so the sensitivity is two. A more complex example is the following. So for each age from one to 100, we want to know how many people there are of that age. We can see that if we add or remove a record from any database, the count in one of these age groups uh, will change by plus or minus one, and the rest are gonna stay the same. So the total change will be one, and so the sensitivity is uh, therefore one. So finally, let's consider our motivating example where we wanted to know the average age of voters and average age of non-voters. So again, for simplicity, we'll just assume that all the ages are a priori capped at 115. And um, for also for simplicity, just to avoid division by zero, we're going to define the average age in an empty data set to be zero. So let's figure out the sensitivity. So what is the largest impact that one person could have on the, on the results of F? Um, so let's consider these two databases, uh, D1 and D2. So D1 is completely empty, and D2 has only one person in it, and they happen to be 115 years old. So if we evaluate our function f on D1, we get 0 as the average age of voters, and 0 as the average age of non-voters. If we evaluate it on D2, we get 0 as the average age of voters, 115 as the average age of non-voters. So these two data sets actually happen to be the neighbors that exhibit the largest difference in f, and so the set sensitivity is 115. So we went through a series of examples computing sensitivity, and let's put it to use. So the Laplace mechanism is a very simple differentially private mechanism. What it says is if you have a, what it says is if you have a function f, uh, for instance, f is the function, uh, so if you have a function f, you can compute its sensitivity, and then you compute the value of f of d um, like this, and then you add Laplace noise with scale sensitivity over epsilon to each component of f of d. So if f is uh, the function that tells us how many one-year-olds, two-year-olds, uh, three-year-olds, and so on, its sensitivity is one. And the Laplace mechanism says that if we add Laplace noise with scale one over epsilon to each of these counts, then the result satisfies 
differential privacy. It satisfies epsilon differential privacy with that specific privacy parameter. Okay, so the Laplace mechanism is a simple technique, but it's not always the best in terms of accuracy. So it's a useful building block, but it's often not sufficient by itself. So let's take a look at um, the next main idea is post-processing. So we just learned that this function over here, this mechanism satisfies differential privacy. It gives us noisy counts uh, in different age groups, but often this is not our final goal. So our goal is not just to know the approximate numbers per se, but we want to understand something about them. For example, we might be interested in how the age distribution of this database differs from the age distribution in the entire population. So this means that we often want to run an analysis on the output of M. For example, we might want to run a chi-square goodness of fit test to compare these approximate age counts to the age distribution in the 2020, 2010 census. So now we have uh, two pieces of code. So the mechanism M, it gives us the noisy counts. And let's say G is a piece of code that um, implements a chi-square test. So we can create a new piece of code that combines them. So let's call this new piece of code G circle M. So what G circle M does is it runs M on the database, runs G on the result, and returns the output of G. So the question is, does this new piece of code satisfy the differential privacy equations? And it turns out that yes, it does. It satisfies epsilon differential privacy with the same exact epsilon parameter that M does, the original mechanism. So there's nothing specific to chi-square testing here. So suppose H is a piece of code that links to external data. We can create a new piece of code called H circle M. And what it does is it runs M on this differentially private mechanism M on the data and produces an output, uh, some noisy output. And then it runs H to try to link this noisy output to external data. Okay, so again, by the post-processing theorem, H circle M satisfies the epsilon differential privacy with the same epsilon. And the fact that we tried to run a linking attack on the output of M does not degrade the privacy protections for the people in our database. So in general, if phi is any function that does not look directly at our collected data, then phi circle M satisfies differential privacy with the same privacy parameter as M. So this phi could look at external data sets and those data sets could have information about the people in our database. But the idea is that since you don't look directly into our data set, you won't learn anything new about those people. So what these functions, um, G, H, and phi all have in common is we run them on the output of M and then we call this post-processing. And what we're seeing is that post-processing does, uh, does not degrade the privacy guarantees. So another way of saying this is that differential privacy is closed under post-processing, and very few other disclosure avoidance techniques actually have this property. So finally, let's talk about composition, the third tool that's gonna to allow us to create more complex mechanisms for differential privacy. So if you uh, tuned in for the earlier talk, we had an example where we used differential privacy to collect private information from senators. So given a yes, no question, a trusted data collector uh, it might be a person or a machine, but it collects the responses, tabulates the votes, and releases the number of yes answers plus Laplace noise with scale one over epsilon one. So this satisfies epsilon one differential privacy. Now, let's suppose this worked so well that we came back the following week, but this time we wanted more detailed information broken down by party affiliation. So the trusted data collector counts the number of yes votes from Democrats, counts the number of yes votes from Republicans, adds independent Laplace noise with scale one over epsilon two to each of these two counts and releases the total. So the mechanism in week two satisfies epsilon two differential privacy. So the week one mechanism satisfied epsilon one differential privacy. It leaks a little bit of information which is controlled by this parameter epsilon one. In week two, we used an epsilon two differentially private mechanism. It leaks a little bit of information which is controlled by the parameter epsilon two but the important question is, what is the combined effect of these information leakages? So when you combine information from multiple releases of data, the combined effect of the information leakages is called composition. And differential privacy allows us to quantify it. So in week one, we used epsilon one differentially private mechanism. If we had only released the output of week one, we could say the privacy loss was epsilon one. In week two, we used an epsilon two differentially private mechanism. 
if we only released week two and nothing else, we could say that the privacy loss was epsilon two, but we actually released the output from both of these mechanisms from both weeks. So the combined release of information from both of these weeks satisfies epsilon one plus epsilon two differential privacy. So in other words, the privacy parameters just add up. So this additive property is why the epsilon parameter is called the privacy loss budget. We can think of it as spending epsilon one of our privacy budget in week one and an additional epsilon two of our privacy budget in week two for a total cost of epsilon one plus epsilon two. So in the general case, um, suppose we have a bunch of mechanisms, M1 through MK, M1 satisfies epsilon one differential privacy, M2 satisfies epsilon two differential privacy, and so on. So from these, we can create a new piece of code, M, and what M does is it goes through the mechanism sequentially. It applies M1 to the data, releases the result. Applies M2 to the data, releases the result, and so on. So this mechanism that runs all of them satisfies um, epsilon differential privacy where the epsilon parameter is the sum of all of these. So in other words, when M releases the output of M1, it pays a privacy cost of epsilon one. When it releases the output of M2, it pays a privacy cost of M2, and, and so on. Okay, so what we've learned, um, uh, we've learned about the Laplace mechanism, post-processing and composition, and now let's apply what we know. So going back to our motivating example, we want to release a privacy preserving version of the average age of voters and average age of non-voters in our database. Um, the ages are capped at 115 and the age of an empty data, the average age of an empty data set is set to zero. So the first thing we can try is the Laplace mechanism, right? So earlier we computed the sensitivity of this specific function to be 115. So if we use the Laplace mechanism directly, we compute the exact average ages of voters and um, non-voters, add Laplace noise, we scale 115 over epsilon, and then uh, release the result. And then disaster strikes, because the average age is a number between 0 and 115. But the noise that we added had standard deviation of around 163 over epsilon. So um, for most reasonable settings of epsilon, the noisy average is uh, completely useless. So this brings us to the first um, uh, main point. The moral of the story is that you can easily waste your privacy budget if you're not careful. So let's try a different approach. Uh, and here's our high-level strategy for attempt number two. We're going to split our privacy budget in half. We're going to use half of it, right, the, the first half, to get the sum of the ages, not the average, but the sum of the ages of voters and non-voters. Uh, these will be the numerators. Then we're going to reuse the remaining privacy budget just to get the counts, number of voters, number of non-voters. This will give us the denominator of the average. Uh, and then the third step is we divide to get our privacy preserving averages. So in more detail, we set epsilon one to be half of our privacy budget. And uh, we use it for this first function F1 over here. So we know that adding, removing one person um, can change the, can change, the total change in here is gonna be 115. So either the change to the sum of ages of voters is gonna be at most 115, or the change to the sum of the ages of non-voters is gonna be at most 115. So the sensitivity is 115. We can use the Laplace mechanism for function F1 by adding independent Laplace noise with the scale to these sums. Uh, the remainder of the privacy budget, we can use it for this function F2 that computes the counts. So we know that these two are disjoint populations. So adding or one, removing one person will have a total change of one. So the sensitivity is one. And so um, we're going to create this, uh, we're gonna use the Laplace mechanism to create these noisy counts. We're gonna take the true exact values and add Laplace noise of scale one over epsilon two. Okay. Uh, finally, we divide. So we take the noisy sum of ages uh, of voters that we got from the Laplace mechanism in step one and divide by the noisy number of voters from the Laplace mechanism in step two. We do the same thing for non-voters and this gives us the uh, noisy average ages. It turns out that the standard deviation here is approximately 325 divided by the number of voters. So that's better than our first attempt because here at least the standard de deviation decreases with the population size. 
Okay, so this result is not particularly stunning, but certainly better than the first attempt. Uh, and in any case, we can always um, improve on this by using uh, more informative statistics about the age distribution. And I'll mention some of the more advanced techniques a little bit later. But first, let's take a look at what we did using pictures. We had one mechanism that satisfied epsilon one differential privacy. We had another one that satisfied epsilon two differential privacy. They're com together, they satisfy epsilon one plus epsilon two differential privacy by composition. We post-process the result by dividing. This doesn't affect the privacy parameters. And then we release the result to the public. So the total privacy cost of this entire mechanism is epsilon one plus epsilon two. But here's something better. So the noisy sum of ages and the noisy uh, counts um, th that we produced as intermediate steps, those are called noisy measurements. We already paid the privacy cost for them, so they are safe to release, and that means that they should be released. So instead of just releasing the average um, at a privacy cost of epsilon one plus epsilon two, we can release the noisy measurements, noisy sum and noisy counts as well, without increasing the privacy cost. So the lesson here is, when dealing with differential privacy, don't just settle for the post-processed result. You should actually demand that you get access to the noisy measurements as well. So what we've learned so far, we can build differentially private mechanisms using Laplace noise, composition, and post-processing. Uh, but you should plan how you do that carefully. So just like with a real budget, it's very easy to waste it if you don't spend it wisely. So when de uh, designing differentially private mechanisms, think carefully about where to inject noise and how to inject the noise. So in our, average, uh, in our example of computing the averages, it may be better to, um, for example, instead of doing what we did previously with attempts one and two, you might be more interested in getting differentially private quantiles instead. Or you might want to get, let's say, a fancier histogram approach that will simultaneously give you accurate approximate counts for all possible age ranges. Okay, uh, and if you're interested in those techniques, here are the papers uh, that are referenced. So now let's take a look at another example, a simple way of performing linear regression using differential privacy. The tools we're going to use are, again, Laplace mechanism, post-processing, and composition. So to fix the notation and the assumptions, we have a data set of records. Each record contains um, a feature vector, which is the same as all of your predictor variables, and a target variable y. So for reasons that will be clear later, we're going to require the L1 norm of each feature vector to be bounded by C1. And uh, similarly, the absolute value of each target to be bounded by C2. So these requirements are going to allow us to bound the sensitivity of intermediate results. And that will allow us to use the Laplace mechanism. So the classical um, linear regression model is that the target is equal to a linear combination uh, of the predictor variables plus an error term. So for simplicity, I'm omitting the usual intercept term that is there. So here um, in matrix notation, Y is a column vector consisting of the target for each record, and X is the design matrix. So every row corresponds to a record. And the goal is to learn the coefficients beta uh, in this model. In the classical case, the classical solution when you have access to the uh, original data, this would be the estimate for beta. So now let's make this differentially private. Our strategy is going to be first to take the privacy budget and split it in half. Um, we're going to call the two pieces epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Using the first piece, we're going to try to get an, est an noisy estimate of this x transpose x inverse term. And then using the other piece of the privacy budget, we're going to try to estimate x transpose y. Once we get these two noisy quantities, we're just going to multiply them together to get uh, an estimate of our noisy model coefficients. So let's examine the details. Um, first, we're going to create a differentially private version of x transpose x inverse in the following way. We're actually going to create a differentially private version of x transpose x because it's easier. So the sensitivity of this term uh, turns out to be C1 squared, where C1 was our a priori bound on the L1 norm of the feature vectors or, or the predictor variables. And so the Laplace mechanism says we can achieve epsilon one differential privacy by adding this amount of noise to each element of this matrix. And then finally, once we have this noisy version, we compute the inverse to get a noisy version of this. 
Okay, so computing the inverse was post used the post processing result, and now let's uh, create a differentially private version of this uh, matrix of this vector x transpose y using our remaining privacy budget. It turns out its sensitivity is c1 times c2, where c1 was our bound on the feature vector, c2 was our bound on the target. Um, according to the Laplace mechanism, we can add this much noise to each element of this vector to satisfy epsilon 2 differential privacy. So the total privacy cost of these two steps is epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 equals um, epsilon. Okay, um, so now we use post-processing again. We multiply our noisy version of um, this term and the noisy version of this term to get noisy model coefficients. Okay, and then finally, instead of just releasing the noisy model coefficients, we can release our intermediate noisy measurements. Okay, and that, that's a simple way to do linear regression. So up to now, we discussed some simple examples of how to construct mechanisms with differential privacy. And we saw that careful planning was necessary to avoid wasting our privacy budget. So let's examine this idea in more depth. Um, so first, it's worth noting that differential privacy is a very flexible uh, framework. So using it, we can do all of the following and, and much more in a privacy preserving way. So first, we can estimate the number of people in different uh, demographic subgroups. We can also build generalized linear models and even get confidence intervals for them. Uh, we can train deep learning models and even create synthetic data. And all of this is possible by carefully planning where to add the noise and how much. So as an illustration, let's take the simplest example. So in a given region, suppose we want to know how many Hispanic individuals there are, and let's call it X. And um, let's suppose we also want to know how many voting age individuals there are and let's call it y. So we want to get privacy preserving estimates of these two. And so the question is, what do we add noise to? So in our first attempt, let's just add noise to x and y. It seems fairly straightforward. So let's take a look at the sensitivity. So for any database, adding or removing one person can change x, number of Hispanic individuals, by plus or minus one, and can change y, the number of voting age individuals, by plus or minus one. Uh, the total change is two, and so the sensitivity uh, delta is two. Okay, so we can satisfy epsilon differential privacy by taking our exact counts, adding Laplace no independent Laplace noise of scale two over epsilon to each one of them. So these measurements are unbiased, and the noise variance is eight over epsilon squared. Okay, so thus um, these X tildes and Y tildes are a fairly accurate approximation to the exact number of Hispanic individuals and number of voting individuals. Um, but as with all things related to differential privacy and in general research and statistics, the question is, can we do better? So let, let's try something else. This might seem silly in the beginning, but um, let's uh, define these new variables. Uh, here S is the sum of Hispanic population plus the voting age population. Notice that these are not necessarily disjoint. And D, D is for difference. D is the difference between these two quantities. So the sum and difference, these are not very intuitive quantities. They don't really have uh, much physical meaning, but let's see what happens if we add noise to them. Okay, so the sensitivity com cal computation is a little bit more involved, uh, but let's see what happens when we add or remove individuals from any database. So if we add someone who is neither Hispanic nor voting age, um, the sum and the difference remain unchanged. If we add someone who's Hispanic but not voting age, then the sum S changes by plus or minus one. Um, and the difference also changes by plus or minus one for a total change of two. So if we add someone who is not Hispanic but is voting age, then S changes by plus or minus one, and um, D also changes by plus or minus one for, again, a total change of two. So if we add someone or remove someone who is both Hispanic and voting age, here we see that S changes by plus or minus two because both terms in the sum change, uh, but D is unchanged because uh, adding this person cancels out when we take the difference. So again, we see that the change is two. So for all of these situations, the maximum change is two, 
and so the sensitivity is two. Okay, so what this means is we can add Laplace noise with scale two over epsilon to S, and similarly to D, and we get uh, these noisy measurements. But this is not what we wanted initially. We wanted estimates for X and Y. So we can reconstruct them. So using uh, noisy S and noisy D, we can get a, a noisy version of the number of Hispanic individuals and a noisy version of number of uh, voting age individuals simply by either averaging S and D or taking their difference and dividing by two. So now the question is, did we gain anything by, by taking this more roundabout route? And the answer is yes. So if we look at the, uh, if we do some simple calculations, we notice that now our variance for X tilde is four over epsilon squared and our variance for Y tilde is also four over epsilon squared. So let's just summarize and compare our two approaches. Uh, so in attempt one, we added noise directly to X and Y. In attempt two, we added noise to linear combinations of X and Y, even though they didn't have um, any physical uh, interpretation. Okay, so if we added noise uh, to directly to the quantities of interest, we would have variance eight over epsilon squared. But if we added noise a little bit more cleverly in attempt two, we get noisy versions of these quantities, but with half the variance. So this process of first figuring out what we want to add noise to, then adding noise, and then reconstructing the quantities of interest is what we call the select measure reconstruction paradigm. And it's very useful, and it's actually one of the techniques being used um, in the 2020 census. Okay, so this also illustrates the point that what you want is not always what you should be adding noise to. Okay, so, so far a common theme has been to think carefully about the noise, and let's examine this in the basic statistical setting of chi-squared hypothesis testing. Uh, so statistics work better with Gaussian noise, and so this is perhaps an appropriate time to mention that there are variants of differential privacy that are compatible with Gaussian noise. So they're a bit more difficult to explain, so I just left some references here that you can explore um, maybe after the talk. Uh, but the idea is when adding noise, the scale of the Gaussian should depend on the L2 sensitivity. So previously we were dealing with the L1 sensitivity where we look at the difference of the function on two neighbors and compute the L1 norm. If we change it to the L2 norm, that'll tell us the scale of the Gaussian noise that we need to use. So for the rest of the talk, actually all we need to remember is that we can add Gaussian noise to protect privacy with slightly different semantics. So to see how we can create a differentially private version of a chi-square test, let's quickly review the classical chi-square test. So chi-square testing is a general framework that allows you to perform hypothesis tests, uh, testing for various hypotheses, such as whether data came from a pre-specified distribution, and this would be the goodness of fit test, or whether two samples came from the same distribution, which is often called the test of uh, two sample proportions. Uh, you can test whether two categorical variables are independent, which is called the independence test, and, and there are many uh, more additional applications. But the general idea behind all of them is you compute this test statistic, which has a quadratic form. So here the um, xi are the number of people of type i in your database, and ei is the expected number under the null hypothesis. So the values that we plug in for ei depend on the type of hypothesis we are testing. So um, statistical theory tells us that under the null hypothesis, the distribution of this test statistic T is asymptotically chi-squared with tau degrees of freedom and tau depends on the type of hypothesis being tested. So in the classical setting, we'd compute the test statistic from the data, see where it falls in the tails of the chi-square distribution. And if the area under this tail is small enough, we reject the null hypothesis. And if not, we fail to reject. So now let's add differential privacy. So we had a data set uh, where xi is the number of people of type i. And suppose someone adds Gaussian noise to each of these counts in order to protect privacy and then gives us the noisy values. So instead of the exact number of people of type 1, we get a noisy version of it called tilde x1. Instead of the exact number of people of type 2, we get the noisy version tilde x2, and so on. So how do we perform a hypothesis test on the noisy version of the data? So let's start with the na most naive attempt, 
let's pretend that these noisy values are the real data. So we have our test statistic. We plug in the noisy data in place of the real data. Um, and then we run it through our favorite software package. We would just tell it it's the real data. It will give us a p-value. And if this p-value is below some cutoff alpha, let's say 0 0.01, we would reject the null hypothesis. So this, approach, uh, this approach, you can, as you may have guessed, is very naive. It does not account for the extra privacy noise. Basically, it ignores it and hopes that this noise is ignorable. And this approach is doomed to fail. So we can run simulations um, of how these naive, let's call them quote p-values, how they behave, and we can compare it to the ideal behavior. So ideally, p-values should be uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. But if we do a QQ plot of the uniform distribution against simulated uh, sampling distributions of this naive approach, we're going to see that the naive quote p-values are actually smaller than they should be. Okay, so just because we added noise to our data didn't change any of the underlying phenomenon in our data. So if we make reject or fail to reject decisions based on these naive uh, p-values, which are biased downwards, we're going to have many false discoveries. Or in other words, our type 1 error will be larger than it should be. So let's try something less naive. We can still compute our chi-squared statistic by plugging in noisy data in the place of the real data. But... Um, now we know that our test statistic, when computed from these noisy data, is not going to have an asymptotic chi-square distribution under the null hypothesis. And that's okay, because we can actually estimate the sampling distribution under the null hypothesis. We can estimate it fairly accurately, and then we can use this sampling distribution rather than the chi-square distribution uh, to compute the p-values. So, um, as you probably expected, these p-values will behave exactly like the p-values should. Right, so we can compare the uniform distribution versus the uh, p-values in, in simulations where we accurately estimate the sampling distribution and we're going to see a good fit. So this is a valid approach. Okay, so in other words, if we reject the null hypothesis when these p-values, these better ones, are below the threshold alpha, then our type 1 error will be alpha. And so we have a valid chi-square test under differential privacy. Okay, so whenever we do this, the next question we have to ask is, are we done? Um, well, so from an aesthetic perspective, there's still something a little bit unsatisfying. So if we compute the standard chi-squared test statistic based on the noisy data, the sampling distribution under the null hypothesis is no longer approximately chi-squared. So one question we could ask is maybe there's a different test statistic and we plug in the noisy data into that different test statistic and its sampling distribution maybe is chi-squared. So is that possible? And the answer is yes. So uh, this result is presented um, in this paper and we call it the projected statistic. So the formula is a bit too large to fit in the remaining space here. So you can look in the paper for more details. But the nice thing about it is that this projected test statistic appears to have much more power than in the previous attempts. So here, here's a chart from that uh, uh, paper. So there have been other test statistics, uh, other approaches prior to it. And this plot is how much power do they lose compared to the projected statistic? And in some cases, uh, it's quite significant. All right, so it seems that we've uh, managed uh, to improve our test through a series of extensions. And now the question is, are we done? Or is it possible to improve the test even more? The answer here again is yes, because if you noticed, we didn't play around with the noise distribution, but we could go back and re-examine how we should be adding noise to uh, improve the test as well. Okay, so overall, let's uh, just recap the takeaway messages. We covered a lot of material illustrating different aspects of mechanism design under, under differential privacy, and we have some main highlights. So first, differential privacy is like building with Legos. So first, it's fun. And second, you can make complex mechanisms from simpler ones using concepts like post-processing and composition. Uh, differential privacy is also like spending money, which a lot of people realize um, a little bit too late. So it's very easy to waste your privacy budget by being naive. So differential privacy requires a certain amount of financial planning, uh, but fortunately, different strategies have emerged in the literature. So the important questions to ask when planning it 
is where do you add the noise? Um, just like uh, we had when we were looking for demographic totals. What do you do after the noise, like in the chi-squared example? And then there's finally uh, a third component, which is a bit more advanced, but you can look in these papers for more details. But this is actually a more accurate tracking of the privacy cost than the composition equations I showed you. So it's actually possible to improve over those. And then finally, um, takeaway messages for an end user of differentially private data products is that you should be aware you can ask for many additional pieces of information, not just the output. So you can get access to the intermediate noisy measurements. In most cases, they're safe to release uh, and they're very useful to work with. Um, you can, sometimes the algorithms create microdata as an intermediate step and that would also be safe to release. And then finally, the source code is always safe to release as long as it used a good, sor a good source of randomness. Uh, so one of the nice things about asking for the noisy measurements is often that they're just counts plus noise, meaning that they're unbiased, uh, they have known variance, they have known distribution, and that allows you to uh, adjust your inference. So if the distribution is complicated, you can just take the source code and run sim simulations through the source code as another way to examine uh, the behavior uh, of, the, uh, of differential privacy and how different hypotheses of your data are affected by the mechanism.